Hi, I'm Mark Madison, and I'd like to welcome you to the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, where we have a very special guest this afternoon. Dr. Stephen Kress is joining us. Uh, Dr. Kress is Vice President for Bird Conservation for the National Audubon Society. He's done extensive work on seabird restoration, and we hope to talk to him for the next 40 minutes or so about some of his conservation efforts, a few of which have been in partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, why don't you tell us a little about your work uh, in Maine at Seal Island National Wildlife Refuge? Okay, thanks, Mark. Well, um, we are working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Patipmanan National Wildlife Refuge to restore the complete uh, community of seabirds that once nested on Seal Island. Uh, this 20, uh, this island is about 20 miles offshore. It's about 100 acres in size, and uh, the history tells us that there were once. Uh, a thriving colony of puffins and arctic terns nesting on the island. Uh, they were thriving until the uh, late 1800s when people came out to the island and shot the birds for food and for feathers. The, the puffins were trapped under nets. They'd, they'd put the nets over the boulders at night while the puffins were sleeping. In the morning, they'd come out and become all entangled, and, and they were eaten by the, the fishermen. And the uh, hunting of terns started in the late 1800s and continued into the early 1900s uh, because the terns were shot to decorate uh, ladies' hats as part of the millinery trade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was, a, a, this was happening not just there but throughout the Maine coast and up into Canada, down into the Florida Keys even, uh, the slaughter of, of seabirds. And it was just thought as a, it's just something to harvest. And uh, they, they harvested them so completely that they extirpated them throughout much of the range. And, and Seal Island lost its, its turns in 18, uh, its, its puffins in 1887. The turns also disappeared about then. Um, they came back on their own with protection when the Migratory Bird Treaty Act law was passed and, and people moved off the island. And then gulls started uh, competing for, for habitat with the turns and puffins. And so Audubon. Uh, has been involved in this kind of restoration program uh, since 1973 elsewhere in Maine. I saw Seal Island as sort of the great test of our of techniques because it was the the uh, place, the great megapolis of uh, puffins and terns on the Maine coast, and and yet it was uh, the birds were gone, and and they probably were not likely to return on their own. So I worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service. We came up with a cooperative management agreement. And then cooperating with the Canadian Wildlife Service, we began transplanting puffin chicks to Seal Island in 1984. And each year we brought down uh, first 100 and later 200 puffin chicks. We put them in sod burrows. We fed them a diet of fish with vitamin supplements. And we nurtured these little chicks. And we banded them and they headed off to sea at night. And then we watched carefully. Um, years went by and we see maybe occasional puffins show up and then a couple of puffins and we put out decoys to help attract them and, and the numbers start slowly building and, and by 1992 we were thrilled when we saw the first puffins come back with fish in their beaks and uh, the, the colony has been growing there since 92 uh, we have um, uh, last summer, 179 pairs wow. of puffins. So the colonies zero. from <laughs> zero. I mean, it was a 105-year period that they were gone until we managed to get them back using these rather labor-intensive techniques. We pioneered them on uh, eastern egg rock in Muscongas Bay starting in 1973. So we knew sort of how to do it, but being able to replicate it at Seal Island was a great... Uh, proof that this technique actually had, uh, was valid and would work. In the turns, we did a similar thing using decoys and, and playbacks of sound, and, and that took about three years to, to click. And, and now the turn colony grew from just a few pairs. Last summer, we had over uh, 1,200 pairs of Arctic turns and about as many common turns, and uh, usually a pair or two of roseate turns. And it's the largest turn colony in Maine right now. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, do the turns and, and puffins cohabitate without yeah, they any do. problems? They do, they uh, do, Mark. Actually, what happened was we started the turn attraction project at first to try to uh, create a protective umbrella over the puffins, thinking that the turns would chase away galls, and they do. And so they don't chase away puffins. They just uh, nest on the surface. The puffins nest underground um, in crevices. And, and if a gall flies out over the colony now, it's, it's usually escorted away quickly by the, by the turns, which are very aggressive and fast-flying, feisty 
bird chase. Tell us a little about the puffin breeding strategies because this this plays a role in, in, in how quickly they come back or, or, or how slow they Right. Come puffin back. is a, a long lived seabird. Um, our band's uh, records show they lived at least 25 years. We don't know how old they live. They may live 40 or more years. One of the benefits of this program is that uh, a long lasting research program will tell us things, new things about the birds. But, anyways, they, they're lo they live a long time. Uh, they usually uh, lay one egg a year, and they both male and female incubate that egg, and then they both male and female help raise the single chick. And the chick goes off to sea. It stays at sea for two to three years. Somehow it remembers where home is, probably magnetic fields or some other mm -hmm. clues. Um, and they usually come back to the site where they uh, hatched. Of course, that's the whole theory behind the, the translocation. Right. They, we moved these chicks from Newfoundland. About a thousand were moved to Seal Island. Uh, those chicks were hand-reared, went off to sea, just like native chicks. They spend the first two to three years floating at sea. They then come back, prospect for two, three years, and then they eventually uh, pick a nest site and a mate. They tend to honeymoon for a year, but first, when they're about four years old, and they'll build a little nest, and they will... Um, defend that nest and then the next year they come earlier and the nest site is already picked out and, and they then move in and lay that egg. That's fascinating. Yeah. Let's talk about puffins just a bit more because it's a highly charismatic sure. species. There's puffin cereal, there's yes. puffin keychains, yes. there's all sorts of puffin paraphernalia. I wonder, as somebody who's worked with them for, for a long time, if, if you have any thoughts on why they're such a charismatic little bird. I think there's several things the puffins have going for them that are sort of consistent with other charismatic birds like penguins, mm -hmm. uh, like owls and parrots, and, and uh, I think it comes down to their upright posture. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. That hadn't occurred to me. Yeah, their upright posture is, uh, reminds us of little humans. And so I think that at the basic level of charisma in, in uh, many kinds of birds, it's uh, the fact they remind us of ourselves. And the fact that they walk, as we do, one foot mm -hmm. in front of the other. And, and, of course, the fact they're brightly colored is a plus. <laughs> the fact that they happen to look like clowns is another plus. And so I hear all the time, oh, aren't they cute? <laughs> and I would tend to agree, actually, <laughs> they are. Uh, and I think it's because they, they bring forward these kinds of insights into our own uh, anatomy. And that makes them appealing. Just get another question about the the main coast and so on. A lot of your work has been with seabirds and so on. Um, why should we care about seabirds? Why are, are they an area we ought to put conservation resources into? Right. Well, we know this, Mark, that the the seabirds were once abundant birds on on the coastlines of uh, North America and and throughout the world. They're very abundant. Uh, we also know that the declines that we're seeing in seabird populations are directly related to things humans are doing to the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be fine if we weren't tampering with their world uh, and messing things up. And so I feel like we have a responsibility as stewards of the Earth and the Earth's wildlife to do something where we can. Uh, sometimes it's uh, sufficient to protect the sanctuary, uh, just posting it. Uh, but with some of the rare species like the puffins and the terns, we have to take steps beyond that. And that's why we've developed these, these restoration techniques, because we know that we were already, the island was protected. It was right. in conservation ownership. It was posted, uh, but without having interns living on the island, translocating chicks, uh, making sure that predation doesn't uh, destroy these, these small starting colonies, uh, we wouldn't be able to be documenting recovery. We'd be documenting extinction. And I think that's really the essence of it. As uh, stewards of the earth, we, we do have an ethical responsibility. Uh, in addition to that, some animals, like puffins, bring economic benefit to the, to the coast. Uh, we have uh, many tour boats now in Maine that have sort of got in the business of taking people out. And, and those companies and the uh, bed and breakfasts and the hotels that all support ecotourism are all benefiting because of wildlife. My wife and I took one years ago. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, she's from the main area. Yeah. And, and, and did you see some puffins? Yes, we did. Oh. But they're very, very hard to see. They're, they're yeah. small. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we haven't talked people, about recently. Most people think that they are huge, like penguins, but they're <laughs> yeah. only like 10 inches right. tall. You know, and so that's part of the education. 
I also think that as people begin to appreciate seabirds, they begin to understand the ocean a little bit more. It's a uh, remote environment to most of us. We're landlocked humans. We're uncomfortable at sea. Um, and so the marine conservation issues, uh, pollution, uh, global warming, ocean level rise, some of the big issues are hard to grasp, but seen through the, the experiences of a puffin, all of a sudden it makes more sense. And when we sort of explain the life cycle of puffins, show how vulnerable they are and how dependent they are. If we care about wildlife, then we also need to care about its habitat. And so the best way to get the attention of the public is by informing them about these animals and getting them excited and, and showing them as part of that. They're vulnerable in one way, but they're, they're also remarkably persistent <laughs> little birds, aren't they? I mean, did you say they actually live at sea for two to three years? I mean, oh, yeah. how I mean, are they adapted? I, I think that's one of the things oftentimes yeah, at least yeah. students have a hard yeah, time being there. Yeah, well, you know, in, their, in their environment, they're great survivors. The, the uh, little ones go off to sea for years. They float on the ocean. Uh, they sleep on the ocean's surface. They dive under for food. They can drink salt water. Uh, they have ability to dive up to 200 feet under the water. They use their feet as little rudders and their wings outstretched as flippers like a penguin can do. They, they can see underwater through a special uh, lens over their eyes. Uh, and so, yes, they have all these, these fantastic uh, abilities to live at sea. And, um, and then do they just return to land basically to, to breed? Is yeah, I, I've often reflected that if they didn't have to lay an egg, they probably wouldn't come ashore at all. <laughs> but birds are linked to land because of the phenomena of an egg. They can't carry an egg. It would make them too heavy. And so they need a floating egg. They, they need a floating <laughs> egg. Of course, the loons have sort of almost developed yeah. that on floating nests. But uh, seabirds have to come to land. And of course, that's where they become vulnerable when people change something in the, in the landscape introduced predators and, and diseases. And that's why about uh, 20, uh, over 25 uh, percent of the seabirds in the world now are considered uh, endangered or threatened because of changes to their habitat. So the techniques we're working with puffins have, have broad application uh, to many of these other species. The puffin is not an endangered bird, mm -hmm. but its life cycle is very similar to other rare and threatened birds, which also lay one egg, live in colonies, live in remote islands. And so we figured from the beginning that if we could demonstrate we could restore puffins, this could have broad application to other species. And now we're seeing that uh, opportunities continue to arise where people are interested in these techniques. Are there any seabirds where it's, where it's not the terrestrial habitat that's causing the decline, but changes in the marine habitat? Or is it almost always the Well, no, there's change. Well, there's pollution issues at sea that are a huge problem. Oil spills, uh, entanglement in fishing gear, uh, uh, eating plastics. Uh, uh, Midway Island, for example, this remote island, it's a national wildlife refuge yep. halfway across the Pacific. Uh, my wife, Alyssa, and I were out there uh, two years ago, and we were amazed by all the the cigarette lighters that were washing up on the shore. Of all places, there was nobody living there, uh, but the beaches were, there were windrows of cigarette lighters. And the um, albatross were, were picking these up, thinking that they were little squids or some mm -hmm. sort of floating marine life, feeding their chicks who then would gag and, and die. So, yes, we're, we're uh, even if it's a sanctuary, a refuge may be protected, but problems at sea are quick to affect the, the life on land. Well, since we're talking about the Pacific mm -hmm. with Midway, you, you've also done some work on the Pacific coast of North America, right. and a, a devil slide yes. in conjunction with San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Why don't right. you tell us a little about that project? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting project. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we had, uh, one day I was in Maine and I got a phone call from uh, someone in California who said, you know, um, I've read your newsletter, the Egg Rock Update, and I think there's something there that we could use out here on the West Coast because there was an oil spill. Um, the Apex Houston Barge had spilled oil along the Central California coast. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a little island called Devil Slide Rock that, that used to have MERS on it until 1986. And then following the oil spill in 86, they disappeared. About 9,000 MERS were killed in that oil spill. And this, uh, this biologist uh, had heard about our work and suggested that uh, perhaps the decoys and the, the, the technique we call social attraction might help. And so uh, we began working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service 
through the San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge uh, to, to uh, create a management plan to bring the MERS back to Devil Slide Rock. We anticipated it would take about 10 years to accomplish this because we feared that all the MERS who once nested there had lost. Like puffins, they'd come back to the same island year mm -hmm. after year. MERS are related to puffins. They look like little black and white penguins. And uh, they had nested on Devil Slide Rock as long as anybody can remember. But in one year, the colony just was gone, and we feared that they were, had all died off. So we, um, we managed to, f to land 400 decoys uh, on this island, and mountain climbers were hired to climb up this very steep sea stack. Yeah. And once they got on top, they, with, they put the decoys in bags, and with ropes, they pulled them up the top. They put car batteries on the ends of ropes. Can you imagine? I mean, it looked like a devil's tower almost. Yeah, it's, it, it, this, this is a sea stack that <laughs> yeah. rises straight up out of the ocean with huge crashing seas all the way around. There's no calm beach, hardly. And um, it's well-named Devil's <laughs> Rock, you know. And pieces of it are sliding off all the time. So anyways, we, we got all the gear up on top. And although we had lots of critics that said, oh, this won't work. You know, this is a waste of money. Right. Uh, within a day of putting up the decoys, we had MERS landing. Imagine how exciting that was. Yeah. Uh, so and that same year, we had six pairs nest, just like that. And we passed the, um, we had hoped after 10 years to have 100 pairs nesting. And we had, uh, last summer, we had 123 pairs. And it was less than, a, uh, less than about five years it passed. That's a great story. So we're uh, really pleased how that's going. Talk about the decoys. I mean, people oftentimes don't consider decoys as a, as a part of bird conservation. Uh, in the past, decoys have sometimes been part of the problem. Uh, where did the idea come from to use decoys to try and bring birds back to islands where they had been extirpated? Well, the decoy start, idea started at Eastern Egg Rock when I was worried that the little puffins we had brought from Canada might not come ashore unless we put out some things. Normally, a young puffin, when it comes back, finds its parents and other adult puffins already well established. Right. And it just sort of is attracted to that group and mingles with that group and eventually finds a mate uh, among the established pairs. But this uh, hiatus of over 100 years of no puffins you know, our puffins that we'd brought from Newfoundland, I feared they would come back and, and, and feel abandoned somehow. <laughs> they wouldn't come ashore. So I, I borrowed this idea from the duck hunters to, right. to make decoys, and we put up decoys of puffins. Originally, I had two types. I had a group that floated in the water, looked very much like a decoy, a duck. Uh, and I had the group on land, and the group we put in the water uh, a storm came up uh, the day after we put them in and scattered them all along the coast. And, and they washed up all the way down to Provincetown, uh, town, Provincetown Massachusetts. I had put on the That's bottom a long of it. Yeah, a long <laughs> journey, a long they, journey they did. And I put on property of Audubon and phone number. And uh, a few people called, and, and, but most people didn't return them. They liked them too much. Yeah. <laughs> so they kept them, but at least we found out where they went. So we, we, we abandoned the floating decoy model in the marine rough water there. But the landing, uh, on-land decoys worked great. And we used mirrors in a similar way. Uh, we borrowed that idea from the aviculture business that mm -hmm. uses them in, for entertaining parakeets and cages. And the idea was to sort of attract the birds um, and to hold them there. And then we uh, started adding sound. When we started working with turn restoration, we started using playbacks of sounds, and we borrowed that idea kind of from the bird watching area where you know yeah. bird watchers know if you play a song a bird is likely to come in but basically the idea was to replicate as close as we could in a sort of simple cost effective way uh, an existing colony and to, and create gathering places for these young what we call prospecting birds young birds that haven't quite committed to the island they may be interested but haven't committed yet and so we would advertise these locations <laughs> with decoys and sound and mirrors. Bird billboards, basically. Yes. Right. It does lead to the question, though. After a while, as they're on the island, don't they notice that some of these puffins are immobile? Oh, I think they <laughs> notice the right away. But still, there's more comfort in sitting with a decoy than there is by yourself. <laughs> you know, if, it, if uh, Yeah, it's instinctive to be part of a flock if you're a colonial bird. And there's a lot right. of instincts that sort of come out here, especially when you move young birds and they... Uh, aren't with their parents. There's not perhaps as much chance. Well, there's not very little chance to learn from adults. So 
Uh, fortunately, these birds have a lot of instinctive behaviors that sort of emerge at the right time. And uh, I think being attracted to others of their kind is one of those instinctive things. Sure. One of the most interesting species you worked with, because it involved um, two endangered species, uh, was the Caspian tern. Mm. And that, uh, that was quite a fascinating story. And, and, and that, if I recall correctly, it was the Caspian terns that were eating the salmon and right. so on. And, and why don't you tell us a little about that? Because okay. that was a... That was one we were involved in in mm -hmm. two different ways. <laughs> right. That was a tricky one. Uh, well, the, the story in brief is that Caspian terns begin congregating on an island called Rice Island in the Columbia River. And they were coming from all other smaller colonies and concentrating. The numbers were building up uh, on this Rice Island, which was an artificial island created by the Army Corps of Engineers that happened to be in a part of the river where fresh and salt water were mixing, and outgoing salmon smolt, the little fingerlings, were uh, spending a lot of time in those mixing waters, adjusting to the marine environment, and it happened to be right next to this, this uh, nesting island for the terns. And it's a little wonder the terns were congregating, because sure. they got these nice meals just a few wing beats away. And uh, it was... Uh, it was only discovered fairly recently that, in fact, most of their diet, like over 90% of the diet, was, was salmon, and they were, in some years, eating perhaps as many as 25 million salmon smolt a year. And uh, the concern was that maybe they were eating endangered salmon as well as, as hatchery-released salmon. Right. Most were probably hatchery fish that had been raised by feeding them on the surface in the hatchery, so they were also more prone to predation. Uh, but uh, would add a sense of futility, though, to, <laughs> to raise hatchery fish, maybe, just, just to feed the Caspian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't clear if even 25 million was affecting the population, yeah. because survival at sea probably really de determines how many salmon eventually come back. Right. But this was a very conspicuous thing. It was hard to ignore, and it seemed like something that should be dealt with. And, and one of the approaches that was suggested was to hire people with four-wheel drive vehicles and just sort of run around during the breeding season and scare away all the turns. In fact, the contract was out. The people were hired with the four-wheel drive vehicles, and they were about ready to land and start running around over the, over the uh, nesting area and perhaps over eggs. Yeah. And, uh, and those that were promoting that idea really didn't uh, care where the turns went and there were no other places for them to go. And so I came up with this idea with, uh, with uh, fellow researchers from the uh, Oregon State University to uh, try to do a restoration project there on another island that was right at the mouth of the Columbia River called East Sand Island. Mm -hmm. And so bulldozers from the Marines were, were brought out, and the Marines helped with this, and they bulldozed away vegetation to expose the sand where the terns used to nest. Right. This was about 15 miles out uh, in the mouth of the river. Again, the critics said, well, they'll just fly back to where the salmon sure. are. It's such a great, it's only 15 miles, it's nothing for a, a Caspian tern that migrates to South America. <laughs> you know, they can easily <laughs> do that. But we argued that uh, they probably wouldn't fly any further than they'd have to if you gave them a chance. So we created this habitat um, on the new island and on the old island, Rice Island, it was planted with winter wheat and, and barriers were put up to make it less suitable and attractive to them. And we put out social attraction, which was the, 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 the trick that we brought from Maine to fool them, to think there were some already there. And we played sound recordings. Um, we get our recordings from the Library of Natural Sounds at Cornell, which has been a great partner it's for It's an this. extraordinary library. Yeah, I mean, you can, it, it you're is. an ivory build. <laughs> That's right. There. You can get whatever you want. Yeah. And, and they burn these uh, special CDs there, and, and we uh, play these recordings nonstop. And the, um, and the birds came right in, and they flocked into these just immediately. And it mm -hmm. just took just two years. The whole colony, about 10,000 pairs, moved over to the new site. Their diet has switched to... Um, almost entirely uh, alternate foods. Um, about 20% still is salmon, but the rest of it is, is herring and sardines and, and anchovies and other fish that, that are in large populations along the estuaries. 
So it's given the salmon a break, and it's given the terns a new site, and now the challenge is, now that we've demonstrated that we can, that these birds are very responsive to mm -hmm. habitat management and social attraction to create additional sites, because the terns are still, all the eggs are in one basket. We're, we're hoping that East Sand Island will be recognized and become a national wildlife refuge. It should be. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very important site. What is it now? Is it just... Uh, it's, um, I think it's state-owned land, okay. and, uh, but it really could be uh, a refuge. I think it should be, and, and Audubon and, and others are hoping that that will become the, uh, the future for it. Now, all the eggs in one basket, this has happened with a couple species, hasn't it? It's probably the biggest problem yeah. seabirds have around the world because things humans have done to restrict their ranges, the ranges often start shrinking, and they become restricted to just a few places. And so many of the species are sort of endemic to a few islands to start mm -hmm. with, but then with changes humans have done to the environment, they become even more restricted. Um, my wife and I uh, just got back from uh, Bermuda, which is another interesting situation where ocean level rise is eroding away the last of the breeding habitat of the Bermuda petrel. Wow. And we see right now there's, they nest on just four little islands. They used to nest throughout Bermuda until yeah. pigs and, and rats excluded them. And the whole population of just 68 pairs is nesting on four little islets. They're literally crumbling like sugar cubes. And every time the hurricanes come, the chunks of these islands fall away, so we're hoping that we can attract some of these petrels to larger islands that are, that are safe from predators. And so it's just another, another application of these techniques. And there's many opportunities for active restoration, but it takes, it takes uh, a lot of thinking in the long term because these are long-lived species, and it takes long-term funding yeah. and structure of uh, organizations to keep these programs going. And some of the problems are long-term problems, problems, like ocean rise. Right, so you know, so. but I think it all, it all comes down to this, that the, the coasts uh, are very crowded with people. And the impact of people um, is an ongoing thing. And we know it, it's conspicuous, something like the piping plover that nests on mm -hmm. sandy beaches, and people love to lay out on beach. That's a classic case. But even islands that are, are wildlife sanctuaries are being affected by people. In Maine, for example, the gall population is huge because people, uh, the fish, local fishing fishermen throw away a lot of lobster bait, and the galls are thriving on that, and therefore they compete with the, the other species of birds. So uh, changes that humans are doing are, are not going to go away. I mean, human presence is probably only going to increase on the coast. So it becomes increasingly important to be proactive and to develop um, strategies for helping these seabirds. We change tracks just for a bit. Uh, another thing you do with Audubon is is uh, education mm -hmm. uh, through you know everything from internships. You've talked about you know uh, studying puffins and terns and so on. To uh, we have some books in our library that that seem geared towards younger people, introducing them mm -hmm. to to puffin projects and so on. And I wonder um, how do you teach conservation, uh, especially seabird conservation at, at various levels. What types yeah. of messages? Because we're an educational institution here, so right. we're very interested mm -hmm. in, in these type of outreach efforts. Right. Well, I, I think that seabirds are probably the best way to engage uh, people of all ages in, in understanding oceans and marine conservation because they're so appealing, so charismatic. And so uh, we, we use that at several levels. In, in Maine, during the summer, we have tour boats. Mm -hmm. we're, that we, we discovered when we were doing the puffin restoration project that this little industry of puffin watching had sort of spontaneously emerged because uh, the boat captains of Maine are kind of entrepreneurish and they saw uh, something to go to that they could sell tickets. It's like whale watching. They were already doing right. whale watching. So they also decided to do some puffin watching tours. But I heard that these boats going around, and they were giving misinformation, and it was being broadcast <laughs> over the loudspeaker. So I figured, why, if they're going to tell people about birds, might as well give them the, the right story. Right. So I approached these tour boat operators and said, we'd be happy to put a, a narrator on board to tell uh, the, the puff and restoration story and conservation, and but they would uh, hopefully contribute part of the the proceeds to our conservation program, and they agreed to do that, and it's been a, a, a huge uh, success. I mean, yeah. we have boats going 11 trips every week, 
Every evening there's a boat goes out of New Harbor, the Hardy boat, and there's a boat goes out of Booth Bay three times a week. And people can see the puffins from the water and they can learn about them. Buy a t shirt and you know, help <laughs> and the, support the help the puffin cause, yeah. And and they can go home and, and tell other people and they can they can adopt a puffin over our website, which is another <laughs> link. Uh, projectpuffin.org dot org. Yeah. Is our website. And that uh, helps people to uh, link to conservation through an individual bird. You know, everybody has to give a gift for a, <laughs> a, a birthday. What better gift uh, than this gift of, of living animal? Do the puffins get perturbed at all by ecotourism? I don't it think so. I don't think so. We don't land. I mean, there right. are these trips that go out, they circle around until people see the birds fly by the boats. And the puffins are curious. Mm -hmm. They will just come by and whiz <laughs> by the boat. And, you know, it's, it's heartening to see the difference. Imagine, you know, a hundred years ago, the boats went out. They were out there to shoot the puffins. And now a puffin goes zipping by the boat, and you hear everybody go, whoo! <laughs> <laughs> They're thrilled. It's quite a transition. It's quite a transition, values. you know, in value shift. Let and, me and it's just, uh, it's heartening to see that so quickly. Oh, and, uh, they are great tours. Right. <laughs> I can speak having been on one. Well, we need to, to wrap up because we, we have to let you get sure. back to your work. Um, but one last question, and, and that would be, you know, in the, in the next 10 years or so, uh, what do you see as our greatest challenge? What, what do you hope we're able to accomplish for, for seabird conservation? And well, I think we, we should continue to develop these techniques for restoration mm -hmm. um, to, to solve some of the problems on the land. Hopefully we will clean up the marine uh, conservation issues, um, protect the birds in their habitat from oil spills and entanglement and nets and plastics dumped at sea. These are all huge issues. Um, but I hope there will be a uh, increasing awareness from the public to care about ocean islands and marine habitats and the puffins and, and other birds because I think that's really what is important. If the public cares, then these other problems will come into line. There will be uh, support for uh, restoration and recovery. But it's going to start from the, the grassroots. It's got to be a caring, informed public. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time on a, you. a busy research schedule. And we'd like to thank everybody who had a chance to tune in. And we hope you'll come back and join us on May 8th when we're going to have a wildlife photographer. Uh, Mr. Uh, Von Honker is going to be out here uh, talking about Alaskan wildlife. So thank you very much for your time.